threat on the Ukrainian border, NATO's withdrawal from Afghanistan, and the United States is turning east. At every turn, it seems like there's a challenge to the unity of NATO. So what does this mean for the future of European security? To answer these questions, we've invited former Secretary General of NATO and former Dutch Foreign Minister, Mr. Jaap de Hoop Schaeffer, to room for discussion. With his expertise, we will explore the Russian threat to Ukraine, NATO's withdrawal from Afghanistan, uh, the challenges to the unity of NATO, uh, whether Europe should become a geopolitical heavyweight, do we need a European army, and the future of European security. My name is Simba, this is Renze. Welcome to Room for Discussion. Yeah, uh, thank you for, for joining us, uh, Mr. Jadob Schiffer. Um, yeah, there is a lot of going on right now in, uh, in NATO from Afghanistan to Ukraine. Uh, are you glad you're not longer responsible for all that's going on right now? No, when, when you are in such a job, I'm, I'm out of it now for 11 years. Uh, when, when you're, uh, when you're uh, in such a job for close to six years, uh, I, I think uh, it's time for fresh blood. Uh, in, in, in general, I do not like uh, mandates in this regard uh, uh, who uh, stretch out over too long a time, too long a period. We see it in the European Union where the President of the European Council does uh, twice, two years, four years. Uh, I've done five and a half. Now there's a special situation in NATO uh, with the present Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg. He's there already for quite some time, uh, but I have the impression uh, that uh, his replacement uh, is going to take place. Uh, but some allies had some trouble uh, to have him replaced under the former United States President. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, I think he'll he'll stay on till the middle of next year. But usual, as a general rule, I'm very much in favor of limiting mandates in, in these important responsibilities because uh, everybody's human. At the end of the day, you might think that the sun is going up because you're in that position, and and, uh, and then you should uh, you should step down. I think. Yeah. So um, for for NATO in general, uh, it's it's founded in a time when it was the primary goal to stop the Soviet Union. Uh, that goal is no longer relevant, so that's the question. What is the purpose of NATO uh, this, uh, this day and age? Well, NATO indeed, as, as you're saying, uh, NATO, of course, was, was extremely successful in its core responsibility during the Cold War, when I grew up, and, and of course the Cold War generation. Then, uh, after the Berlin Wall had fallen and, the, and the, after the demise of the Soviet Union, uh, NATO was looking for and found, I think, we'll discuss it without any doubt, uh, what, what I qualify as an expeditionary role. And my NATO mandate between our 2004, 2004, 2009 was, were the heydays of a very expeditionary NATO. Uh, when, when I started my mandate in 2004, do not forget, relations with Russia were quite good, were quite good. We had a NATO-Russia Council. Uh, when I left in, in 2009, uh, relations were at the low ebb. And now, and now it is a sort of permafrost uh, uh, after everything what has happened uh, over the past few years. But N NATO found uh, a purpose. But after that very expeditionary period uh, during my mandate, uh, I mentioned Afghanistan, I could mention Kosovo, uh, the Mediterranean, assisting the African Union, uh, uh, link, link, linking with all kinds of operations and all kinds of partners, I should, I should add. NATO now, 2021, is still, to a certain extent, expeditionary. NATO is still in Kosovo. NATO is still doing other things outside of the NATO area. But given the relationship with, uh, with Russia, uh, its core uh, responsibility has come uh, in, into the foreground again. Uh, and that might sound uh, perhaps to some uh, a bit exaggerated when you're living in The Hague or London or Brussels, but when you travel to the Baltic states, you travel to Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, that threat is very well and very strongly felt. Um, now, and, and, and then you have, but that's, that's a different chapter, NATO 2021, the Biden administration and the fact that we are growing into a world where we do not have one superpower, but we have two superpowers. And that is a fundamental change, which of course also affects NATO. Mm -hmm. Yeah, let, let's talk about uh, the new uh, President Biden uh, and his administration. Uh, he has announced that NATO is, is withdrawing its troops from uh, Afghanistan after 20 years. Um, as, as a former Secretary General, do you agree with this decision? 
Well, if, 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 if I give you an honest answer, <clears throat> I, I would have preferred personally, and there was also some discussion if, if, if this decision had been, uh, had been taken after consultation with allies, I got the impression that the NATO allies were not fully informed, but I might be wrong here. Uh, I'm not in the, in the inner circle, of course, uh, again. I, I, I would have preferred personally uh, uh, that, that uh, what's left now uh, in Afghanistan close to 3,000, 2,500, 3,000 US forces. Uh, it's not much, of course, in numbers, but it is, it is more than a token presence. Psychologically, politically, it is relevant. And, and as you know, linked to the US presence, uh, where other allies, like the Dutch, but not only the Dutch, the Netherlands, uh, uh, having, having uh, uh, forces in Afghanistan for training the Afghan security forces themselves. Uh, so. If you ask me, my honest answer is uh, I'm, I'm not uh, happy, entirely happy with it, although I can understand the Biden decision, because when Joe Biden was vice president under President Obama, uh, he already, and I, I met him several times in that capacity, he was then already, and I'm now speaking uh, about uh, 2009, uh, he was very much in favor of, of leaving a, a very small counterinsurgency force in Afghanistan. And you might remember, uh, and, and students might remember, that Obama then, uh, after much toing and froing and after much discussion, decided uh, uh, in a contrarian way. He decided for a, for a huge surge, which brought up the total presence uh, uh, to around 150,000 troops, imagine. 100,000 no. Americans and 50,000 NATO forces and partner forces. Uh, but again, it, it is as it is, uh, as, as we say, and Biden has taken this decision, uh, and that has consequences for NATO and consequences for the NATO allies, because without that form of presence, politically, psychologically important, and the force protection element uh, stemming from that presence, it is very difficult for the Dutch and for other NATO allies to, to have their residual military capacity, training capacity in Afghanistan. But if we look, of course, at the situation on the ground, vast areas of the, of the country are still actually contested between the government and the Taliban. So in your view, how much longer should we have stayed? Wouldn't we have ended up staying there perhaps for another, another 10 years? Well, ideally, but I say and underline ideally, uh, because ideally is not politically, uh, and I've been in the in the in the country many many times uh, under my uh, under my NATO in the, during my NATO mandate. I, ideally, uh, this would be a matter of generations, plural. Uh, but democracies uh, are always out of breath, as we all know, because every four or five years you have elections. Yeah. In autocracies, that's that's more easy. Uh, but uh, as we all know, as you know, and as I know, uh, the political support for uh, the military presence in Afghanistan has dwindled uh, and, 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 and has uh, dwindled to such an extent uh, uh, that NATO allies uh, had already withdrawn the bulk of their forces before President Biden took his final, his final decision. Um, so uh, Afghanistan, uh, when, you, when you look at its history, uh, how the British did not survive Afghanistan, how the Russians failed, uh, I would say, on balance, uh, on, on, on the NATO operation mandated by the United Nations, the jury is still out. You cannot say that, that everything uh, was, was in vain, as some critics do want us to believe. But it, it is still very complicated and, and, and very difficult. And, and I would be in favor of a very serious evaluation uh, of, of this decade or plus, decade plus, I should say, much more than a decade, almost two decades, I realize, uh, that, that the West, quote unquote, NATO, Western forces, US forces were in Afghanistan. Uh, and it's to be hoped uh, uh, that, that the Afghan security forces can do what they're trained for. Uh, but I'm not without any doubt here, I must admit. Yeah. You, you bring up, of course, critics. And if we look at a few numbers, we looked at the Washington Post, they say the Taliban is able to launch attacks in up to 70% of the country. Of course, the war costs around 241,000 lives, and the, the democracy in the country, you know, is fairly shaky. Would you say that the mission is a failure? No, no, I, I def def definitely not. 
a, a lot has been achieved. Uh, the question is, of course, will it will it last? Uh, and let's not uh, uh, go from the assumption that that uh, the Taliban uh, has an interest, because there is, as you know, parallel to the withdrawal, there's also a peace process going on in Doha, in, 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 in Qatar, um, where at least uh, parties talk to each other. There are parties up till now were the Taliban and the, and the Americans, so the Afghan government should be brought into the negotiations as well. I have my doubts if the Taliban uh, have a huge interest in, in going back to the future. Uh, and what do I mean with going back to the future? Go, going back to uh, as the situation was uh, when, when they were, were running the country. Uh, I, I, I think that is that might not be a realistic scenario for the Taliban. But I, I agree, why I, is that? I, take, I take your point uh, that, that in, 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 in quite a stretch of the country, uh, the Taliban are in control as we speak. That is absolutely true. And why is that? Why would the Taliban not want to go back to the, the uh, status quo ante? Because I, th I think there is a different, uh, there is a different uh, uh, Taliban leadership. Uh, they also see uh, that in, 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 in many relevant elements, the country has moved forward. But you then can ask the question from what, what is in Afghanistan moving forward from A to B? So I, I do not see a Taliban which will a, a, again go for, for the destruction uh, of, of Afghanistan in the sense that they will close all girls schools, the, the millions of girls still going to school, uh, what, what the operation uh, has contributed in, in Afghanistan. So I'm, I'm, not, I'm not totally and overall pessimistic uh, as many commentators are. Yeah. Uh, and I, I don't buy uh, the conclusion uh, that this whole operation costly as it was, uh, uh, human life lost costly as it was, has been, uh, has been in vain. And, 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 and that position is supported, for instance, in the Netherlands uh, uh, by, by uh, a commander of the Dutch armed forces who lost his own son in Afghanistan, General Van Um, uh, who is also of this opinion. Uh, uh, when, when he is, uh, I, I don't doubt that analysis. But again, the future is uncertain in Afghanistan. I, I, I fully take your point. I mean, I can give you the guarantee in this interview that everything uh, will uh, will remain all right uh, after the Americans have left uh, have left the country. Yeah, of course, the withdrawal of NATO troops, of course, brings with it a, a power vacuum. Do you see another geopolitical player stepping into that uh, vacuum? Well, the, the, that that is Afghanistan's fate. That is, that is an, an an excellent question. I have always asked myself. Uh, during my NATO years and afterwards, up till now, uh, one of the key questions, is Pakistan a part of the solution in Afghanistan or is Pakistan a part of the problem? No. And as you know, Pakistan and then more specifically the ISI, the Pakistani Security Forces, with whom I've always been in touch during my, uh, my, my mandate, is considering uh, Afghanistan uh, as quote-unquote strategic depth uh, in, in their confrontation and conflict with, with, with India. When you go to the western part of the country, uh, you, have, uh, you have Iran uh, having, having an interest. You have India, of course, uh, having a major interest in Afghanistan. And last but not least, you have China, which in a fairly intelligent way has entered Afghanistan uh, and is, uh, is mining a lot of raw materials. Uh, so the question is coming back to your uh, question about about what's next and about the Taliban there are also parties and China is one of them who have no interest uh, in the whole country blowing up again under Taliban rule uh, but again uh, uh, critics will say uh, to me after Hof's pepper history has proven you wrong and will prove you wrong uh, and, th and that's why I started my my answer with the jury still out it, it is no. it is very difficult to predict there is a peace process going on. There are major parties having an interest. And the question is, if those major parties who have through history always fought over and for Afghanistan, if they have an interest in a completely destabilized Afghanistan. And, and how could future political instability or potential political instability in Afghanistan affect us here in Europe? Well, let, let's, let's first answer, your, let me first answer your question by, 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 by saying that uh, I, I would hope 
uh, uh, that, and I've, I've, I've said this before publicly, uh, that, that after the American withdrawal, when for some of those parties uh, a hurdle has been cleared, uh, uh, that you would uh, and could arrange a group, call it the Friends of Afghanistan, where you, where you have a number of, of parties and nations, big ones, who are interested in, in Afghanistan's future, get together uh, uh, and, and be at least on speaking terms with each other uh, to, to prevent the whole thing uh, uh, blowing up again in, in Afghanistan. What is the consequence for, for, for NATO? No direct consequence. NATO has, under that UN mandate, in, in this respect, fulfilled its mission, and do not forget the, the beginning of the mission, uh, uh, that Afghanistan is not anymore the breeding ground and the basis for all kinds of, of terrorists, although, although critically, I must say, ISIS also has a presence in Afghanistan, but it's no longer the basis from which all kinds of terrorist attacks can be organized and planned for all over the world. Uh, but again, for NATO, coming back to your question, uh, Af Afghanistan uh, will, will drop on NATO's agenda. Uh, because NATO simply will will not have any more, uh, any more, uh, an, any more substantial presence in the country. Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah. Let's let's talk about another uh, conflict that we already uh, that you already mentioned in the, in the beginning. It's about uh, the Russia threat, and uh, at this moment, um, the withdrawal of the Russian troops at the Ukraine border uh, was there, uh, but the tensions have died down at this moment. Um, but are likely to flare up um, in, in the future, as we have seen uh, in the past with, with the Crimea in 2014. So uh, is NATO allowing itself to be pulled into another conflict with Russia, in your opinion? Well, this, this, is, this is quite quite a complicated one. Uh, <laughs> for, for, first of all, there, there are still a substantial number of Russian troops left. Uh, so so mm -hmm. Putin's pressure on Zelensky and, 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 and Ukraine has not subsided. Uh, and, and any moment, uh, if Vladimir Vladimirovich would so decide, uh, he, he could stir a lot of trouble. Um, the relationship between Ukraine and NATO is, is as you know, uh, because you've done your homework, a very complicated one. Mm -hmm. um, I presided over a summit in 2008 in Bucharest, uh, where after a huge fight, between the Americans, uh, President George W. Bush on the one hand, and the French and German leaders, Merkel and Sarkozy then on the other hand, uh, Bush very much in favor of bringing Ukraine closer to NATO, membership action plan is, is the jargon for that. Sarkozy, France and Germany dead against. Now that led to a huge fight, uh, uh, which I as Secretary General could not control anymore. Uh, as you know, the, the proverb, when the ele elephants get fighting, the, the grass is trampled. Well, I was, I was the grass in, in, that, in that, that summit, and I was, being, uh, I was being trampled. But the result was, and the compromise was, in the communique of that Eucharist summit, they, and they was meaning Ukraine and Georgia, they will become NATO members without a timeline, without further qualifications. Uh, Putin whom I met the next morning at that summit, uh, uh, said to me, uh, uh, Secretary General, uh, you will realize this will not be. And I, I played the naive uh, guy and I, I said, Mr. Prime Minister, because if I remember correctly, he was not present then, but Prime Minister, but he swaps on a regular basis, as you know, <laughs> and will stay on forever, uh, almost forever. Uh, but he, he, he said to me, Basically, this communique is not acceptable. And in 2008, August, this was April 2008, in August 2008, as you will remember, he invaded Georgia. Mm -hmm. uh, so Ukraine and Georgia and NATO membership is for Putin a red line. And I personally question the wisdom uh, of the words in that, in that communique. Uh, now, now, back to the, now back to the present. And, and there is no consensus in NATO now around the corner uh, if you would try to go that way again. Uh, although, although, although President Zelensky uh, would, would rather see that happening, uh, happening tomorrow. Uh, so Putin and Ukraine, Russia and Ukraine is something very special. Do not forget that the Russian Orthodox Church 
which Putin uses in his foreign policy, uh, as, as some of the czars did uh, in, 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 in the old days. The Russian Orthodox Church originates in Kiev. It was Kiev on Rus in yeah. 9, 981 after Christ, if I, if I remember correctly, where the then leader converted to Christianity, and that's where the Russian Orthodox Church. So for many Russians, Kiev was, and for Putin, should be part of Mother Russia. So Russia, Ukraine is, is very special. I'm not saying that that in any way justifies Putin's policy vis-a-vis -vis Ukraine, justifies the annexation of Crimea, justifies the threats we see at, at the present moment. But we should realize that it is a very complicated relationship. We should yeah. also realize that Vladimir Putin has one huge ambition. Vladimir Putin was a young KGB officer in Dresden in the German Democratic Republic when the wall fell. And he saw the German masses marching down the streets under the heading and the banner, Wir sind das Volk. He was a KGB officer and his whole world fell apart when that Berlin Wall fell in 1989. That is still first and foremost on his mind. I've met him many, many times in my, in my, in my NATO years. Putin basically wants his empire back, quote unquote. He knows that is, of course, out of the question, but he wants exclusive political influence in what he considers Russia's near abroad. No. He qualifies mm -hmm. it as Russians near abroad. And, and Ukraine, or certainly large part of Ukraine, in his opinion, are part of his near abroad. Georgia is part of his near abroad. Moldova is part of his near abroad. In, in, in other words, that is Putin's ambition. Yeah, uh, but then, then still... the, Balt the Baltic states, thank heavens, are members of NATO. Mm -hmm. So there will always be huge tension in the Russia-Ukrainian relationship. But to come back to your question, and I apologize for the long answer, but <laughs> this question needs no a long answer. NATO will not go to war for Ukraine. NATO will support Ukraine politically. In my opinion, NATO allies should support Ukraine with weapons. And as far as I'm concerned, not only with non-lethal, but also with lethal weapons. Ukraine should be in a position to defend itself if, if I don't know, if Putin uh, would, 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 would stir more trouble than he's already done. But it is a very complicated uh, relationship, and, and Putin, Putin is, is, is keeping the country under permanent pressure uh, mm -hmm. by, this, by these troop masses uh, uh, around Ukraine's border. Yeah, and then um, okay, uh, many of Russia's actions are uh, like election interference and uh, disinformation fall in the so-called grey zone uh, beyond diplomatic action, but not outright nuclear confrontation. So uh, how can NATO respond than to such gray zones. Well, this is what 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 what's in your question is 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 the famous hybrid warfare, mm -hmm. the Gerasimov doctrine, Gerasimov as, as the as the commanding officer of the Russian forces, a combination of fifth column uh, cyber uh, hacking, uh, uh, what 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 have you. Uh, NATO will, without any doubt, uh, uh, not react in kind militarily. As I said before, N NATO will not wage war uh, over and for and for Ukraine, uh, although some allies might might prefer that, that option. But I repeat myself, there will be no consensus in the NATO ranks, not around the corner, but not, not, uh, not in the future either. NATO will uh, react and has to react by being as closely politically involved with Ukraine. There's a NATO-Ukraine commission. Use it to the full. Uh, see, uh, as, 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 as we have in the Normandy format, uh, where France and Germany are discussing uh, with uh, Vladimir Putin, it's also stopped that, that negotiating uh, the format, by the way. Germany is also involved, uh, by, by the way. But, but anyway, uh, NATO should should keep Ukraine politically as closely to its chest as possible, to use that, to use that phrase. NATO should support uh, Ukraine uh, with weapons, in my, in my opinion. And I said, although I think the consensus up to now is non-lethal weapons, in, 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 in my opinion. And do not forget, and that's important, President Biden is much more critical uh, of Russia uh, than President Trump was. Uh, and President Biden is a great friend of Ukraine. 
That doesn't mean that President Biden will in any way wage war for Ukraine. He will not do that, uh, I, I think, and I'm, I'm convinced. But uh, uh, Biden and Ukraine is a very close bond, uh, and that we should also take into account. Yeah, but is, is it also, uh, that's, that's the question that we, uh, yeah, we get very often is that it, uh, Europe is too much dependent on the Russian gas. Is it also uh, one of the factors that means that we in Europe cannot decide, uh, not act decisively on Russia's behavior? Well, the, 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 the problem the European Union has uh, and the problem NATO has is that neither the European Union nor NATO has a consistent Russia policy. Uh, that was already in my days the case, and, and that has not changed. Uh, everybody understands that for historical reasons, Germany has a very special position always vis-a-vis -vis the Russians. Uh, Germany will, will never be in a, in a position to be in the forefront, aggressively, politically in the forefront vis-a-vis uh, -vis Russia. That's the reason uh, that Chancellor Merkel, whom I admire enormously and who will, who will leave a huge void when she steps down later this year, Chancellor Merkel is still uh, committed to the Nord Stream 2 pipeline, coming back to your question surrounding around gas. I, I would say the moment has come, given the fact what Putin does uh, in, in and around Ukraine, uh, that we should suspend Nord Stream 2. Uh, but Chancellor Merkel has always insisted that this is not a political uh, project, it's an economic project. Mm -hmm. uh, that's untrue, sorry. Uh, it, it is very political, it's very geopolitical. Biden wants it stopped, the Americans want it stopped. Uh, in, 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 in Europe, uh, one is divided, nations are divided. Uh, is, is Europe too much dependent on Russian gas? Yes, I think it is. Uh, the Americans have, on the other hand, geopolitics is complicated. They have a huge interest in exporting LNG, liquid financial gas, to Europe uh, and to the European Union. Uh, Europe is building terminals for LNG uh, because we we do, do not have do not have enough. In other words, this whole gas dossier, to use that expression, is 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 complicated. Um, and I do not know if if Nord Stream will be finished uh, or will be suspended. It's very geopolitical because it has a direct consequence and bearing on Ukraine. No. Uh, and, and, and Russia's pressure on Ukraine will be made much easier when Nord Stream 2 is functioning. Uh, because Ukraine now has that position, they will be financially compensated and what have you. But if your question is, is, is Europe too much dependent, becoming too much dependent on Russian gas? My answer is yes. All right. I think what makes a lot of these events so relevant, both in you know Ukraine and Afghanistan, is the fact that they occur at a time when perhaps the unity of NATO is being put a little bit into question. We saw that, of course, with you know Trump's uh, America First policy, but even with Biden, although he has refocused a bit toward Europe, there generally is a trend of turning more towards China, towards the East. So, has the relationship between Europe and the United States changed forever, in your opinion? Yes, I think it has. I think it has, uh, and, and you, you quite, quite rightly refer to, to China and NATO. Everyone, everybody, I should say, uh, uh, be it NATO, be it the European Union, be it the United States of America, be it China, will have to get accustomed to a two superpower world. And that also for my generation is quite new. I mean, since the Second World War, we have lived under and with Pax Americana. Uh, the Americans have protected us, uh, Pax Americana. The, American, the Americans, and, and, and the qualification is here, exceptionalism. I mean, the Americans, a force for the good. Things went wrong from time to time in Vietnam, in Iraq. Uh, we discussed Af Af Afghanistan. But now uh, NATO should realize, and that was your question, and we in Europe, the European Union as much should realize that Europe is not Biden's first priority. China is. Uh, yes, President Biden is very much committed to NATO, not a shimmer of a doubt, I, I, re I repeat, but President Biden will ask his NATO allies, his European Union partners the question, Listen, my friends, my dear friends in Europe, my dear transatlantic friends, we are in a partnership. We are bound by values. NATO is a value-based uh, alliance. The European Union is a, is a, is a value-based organization. 
My question to you, dear European friends, is what is your weight in this partnership? In other, in other words, what will you bring to the fore politically, uh, financially, economically, militarily? Think about the 2% no. uh, and, and, and the fact that many NATO allies, including the Netherlands, are still far from the commitments they made in 2014 in a, at, a, at a NATO summit yeah, in, 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 in Wales. And what, why is that, in your opinion, that uh, some countries are still constantly failing in meeting the 2% two, two benchmark? Because, because politicians realize uh, that a generation, or I should, I, I, I should correctly say, I think generations, at least one and a half generation, is growing up without any perception of threat and any perception of I might lose, we might lose security, we might lose freedom, we might lose our freedom of expression, uh, we might lose. Think about COVID-19, think about the pandemic. Why is it, why is it so leaning or weighing so heavily on, on all of us? because we have lost control. Why was Boris Johnson's slogan so, so terribly effective in Great Britain on Brexit, a drama Brexit, I'm dead against, take back control, uh, a very intelligent uh, uh, phrased slogan. We see now in the pandemic uh, that, that we have lost control and we have trouble in losing control and losing freedoms having a curfew, uh, uh, lines in front of the shops. We have lost control. Uh, we were not, we have lost part of our freedom, past the part of our freedom to go where we want to go, to see whom we want to see. Now, now trans, trans, how should I say, transfer this line of thinking to, to freedom and, 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 and to liberty. Uh, when I look at, 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 at my daughters who are in their early 40s, Freedom came automatically. When I look at myself, I'm 73 now, freedom came automatically. There never have been a shimmer of a doubt that I would... If you, if you buy that analysis, it, it, is, it, is, it is understandable that in a council of ministers in the Netherlands, let's take the Netherlands as an example, where I was sitting as a foreign minister, when, when, when the money has to be divided there, the minister responsible uh, for social security, the minister responsible for healthcare, will always have a, a much stronger position than a defense minister raising his finger or a foreign minister raising his or her finger and, and saying, excuse me, prime minister, but we have made a commitment, 2% GDP. Then his answer will be, oh, that, that means 7 billion euro a year. Uh, are, you, are you kidding me? But and, and in public opinion, in public opinion, there there is there is only only limited support. And in the meantime, we have we have been cashing so much peace dividends since 1989 uh, that the Dutch armed forces or the German Bundeswehr uh, is 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 becoming more and more ineffective. Uh, but it, it's mentally, it's psychologically. Uh, because we, th we think that, that, that the, the world we live in, the freedom we have, the liberties we have, uh, are, are, are guaranteed forever. That is not the case. Mm -hmm. So the countries, uh, these countries don't have uh, a special uh, or, or specific incentive to do so, to meet... No, I don't think they have. Politicians mm -hmm. make it easy for themselves. Uh, by, by not coming out strongly in favor, look at the Netherlands again, all political parties, yeah. all political parties across the spectrum, I mean, they, they, they are in the, same, in the same boat because they, they have all let this happen. Uh, but again, the Dutch are no exception, unfortunately, in, 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 in NATO. We, we, we take it for granted. And when I answer your question as I do, please, hi, yeah. Jaap de Hoogschreffer, usual suspect, former foreign minister, NATO yeah. secretary general, yeah. Of, of course, he can't. He can't. He can difficultly say anything else. You see, mm -hmm. so so. I mean, we we had a we had a private campaign in this country, financed by 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 a businessman. Uh, you you might have seen the spots on on, on television. It came under the heading. Psst, uh, let's let's discuss defense. Yeah. Uh, I I I I can't make it better. Uh, there are a few parties now who in the in their election manifestos 
they, they, they promise a bit more. Uh, I'm eagerly, but also impatiently, but also with a lot of concern waiting for, for the next government and, and, and what the decision finally uh, will be. We're going down the slope. We're not going up the slope yet. Well, yeah, of course, you know, with, with the sort of lack of spending comes a little bit of a perhaps dependence on, you know, the United States. And, you know, some would say that that has caused us to also be dragged along with some of the United States' you know, foreign policy adventures, for instance, uh, Libya, Syria, and that some of those uh, interventions have also caused you know, things like the migrant crisis that has caused problems for Europe. So you know, would you say that uh, our pursuit of perhaps America's foreign policy needs are actually hurting our own interests? Well, one, 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 one small correction, Li Libya uh, was, was, was finally uh, uh, nay, what was initiated by by uh, by then fr France and and the UK uh, uh, by by Cameron and, and 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 Sarkozy, because Obama then already said we'll lead from behind. You remember that that famous uh, or for some infamous phrase of Obama, and the uh, European allies were not able and, con and without American support uh, to bring that operation to uh, to, to an end. And Lib Libya is now a, a total chaos. So I mean, so so much for that. It, it is true, without any doubt, uh, also in my own lifespan and career, uh, that, that Pax Americana uh, limited uh, uh, Europe's uh, alternatives, uh, if, if I may use that, use that expression. Uh, they are, they were, and they are the ultimate guarantor. Uh, will that now change? I think, yes, it will change because the, the Biden question I phrased a moment ago, what is your weight in this partnership, will definitely bring Europe or the European Union, but I do not limit this to the European Union only because you have also non-EU members uh, who, who should be part of this, uh, in, in, in my opinion, uh, like, like a country like Norway, for instance, but also, but also others. Uh, the moment the bell for for uh, for Europe is ringing uh, to take more responsibility uh, for its own uh, uh, defense outside the realm of Article Five scenarios, if you understand what I mean. Again, yeah. Putin doing stupid things in in the Baltic states. Uh, Biden uh, will will and the U U.S. will immediately uh, uh, come to our assistance. But now, and now I link it with migration, a, a major crisis in the Sahel, in the Sahelian zone in Africa, uh, where climate change meets terrorism, from Boko Haram to ISIS uh, to uh, uh, Al Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb, all those terrorist uh, organizations moving in that vast ungoverned space in the, in the, in the Sahelian zone. Imagine France is in Mali uh, as they speak. The Dutch were participating in Mali and other and other uh, 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 UN. It was a UN operation. The French are outside UN. The UN operation basically. In, imagine a major crisis there. Uh, I can hardly imagine uh, that when military presence would be needed and half military power would be needed, not a police mission, not UN blue helmet, a half military mission would be needed there. I don't exclude it. Some people say there's a second Afghanistan in the making in the, in the Sahelian zone. Uh, that we then could go to the Oval Office and the White House and said, Mr. President, we ring your doorbell. Could you please help us out? Yeah. So that, that's another major complication uh, uh, that, that I can, um, I can, I, I gave you one example. I can imagine a scenario where Europe would be in a, had to be in a position to project half military power. Now, then it gets even more complicated when you look at Brexit, because the Brits have left the European Union, are still a European nation. What global Britain means, I do not exactly know, but that, that's for another, for another interview, I'm, 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 I'm afraid. Germany is never in the forefront. So what's left then is France, with the tradition of projecting mil military power. So what is necessary, that when you talk about European defense, and don't don't use the word, in my opinion, strategic autonomy, because I, I think I think it's an it's an empty slogan. Uh, the Americans don't like it because they define autonomy as as Europe will do it alone or by themselves. Uh, strategic power is is my preferred expression. Europe needs strategic power, strategic military power, but not autonomy. But but. Europe will have to, to get its act together uh, for operations without the United States of America. 
Yeah. And I say again, the US will focus very much on, 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 on China because China is their first priority. So, so uh, if I hear you correctly... Politically, uh, the Americans will, will ask uh, their European allies, are you with us in our China policy, dear friends? Or are you not with us? No. And on, 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 on trade, uh, uh, I, I see a situation where the Europeans and the Americans definitely do not see eye to eye on, 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 on many issues. So we have with the Americans also, also a number of, of rather fundamental differences uh, and, 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 and differences in, in our analysis. Uh, so uh, Europe, Europe and Europeans have to answer a lot of questions in the military, but also in the, in the economic, financial, political domain. So, so if I hear you correctly, you're saying it's time for an independent European foreign policy? If there ever was a moment, if there ever was a moment for the European Union to grow up, it is now. Uh, because the Chinese are also doing everything they can to gain as much influence uh, uh, into Europe and into the European Union as possible. Politically, look at the Western Balkans where the Chinese are very active. Look at where the Chinese invest. Uh, look at, at, at the buying spree uh, the Chinese are, are, are in. In other words, if, if, if Europe doesn't get its act together, as far as competition policy is concerned, as far as industrial policy is concerned, uh, Europe might be on the menu. Uh, I'm, I'm not making a plea here, uh, far from it for equidistance of, of us Europeans vis-a-vis -vis the US on the one hand and Chinese on the other hand, definitely not. We share the values very much with the, with the Americans. Uh, but we have to be careful and vigilant uh, in what we allow China to do and not to do inside the domain of, of, of the European Union. Uh, and we might, we might see more examples uh, where the European Union's foreign policy uh, is not exactly in line uh, with what the United States is going to do. No. I'll, I'll give you the China e example again. B Biden has a, has, a, has a rather tough China policy. And you know that in the US, the China policy is, is about the only element which has bipartisan support. Uh, so Biden will, without any doubt, be tough on China. If I then look at the, at the European Union member, prominent member, most important member, uh, a nation like Germany, G Germany's foreign policy has always been rather export-driven, export-oriented. Uh, Germany likes uh, and, and sells extremely good cars, to give you an example, the Audis, the BMWs, the, the, the what have you, the, the Daimlers and the Mercedes. Uh, I could very well imagine uh, that, that US foreign policy vis-a-vis -vis China and European foreign policy would, would not be totally aligned. That's why that Biden question I refer now to for the third time, what is your weight in our partnership, dear friends in Europe, is, is such an important question, but perhaps also such an, uh, a, a complicated question. Yeah. I mean, earlier you referenced the term uh, strategic autonomy. Uh, what does strategic autonomy mean to you? I, I have no idea. In the military domain, I have no idea. I can imagine strategic autonomy, for instance, as, as one of the lessons from the pandemic, that Europe becomes more independent where it concerns the, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the produce, producing vaccines. For instance, uh, are we too much dependent on nations like, like India, uh, the United States? Uh, well, Vaccines are, are geopolitical tools, as you know. Uh, look at look at Russia. Look at look at China. Uh, look at ourselves. Vaccines are a geopolitical tool. Uh, I can imagine, and I say, uh, uh, if there ever was a moment for Europe, it is now. Mm -hmm. I can very well imagine autonomy for Europe for the European Union in many more areas, but not not in the realm of defense, not yeah. in the realm of of how strategic autonomy. Is, is now being used also in Brussels by European institutions. Mm -hmm. yeah, they, they, uh, I, I mean, that, that, that is really a misnomer. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, it is an, an empty slogan. Yeah, take uh, for example, like, uh, China, uh, if I may, uh, China, sh should we be doing as, as China does? So start supporting European companies in strategic sectors like technology? To gain well, there, there is, as you know, in Brussels, a discussion going on uh, uh, on the one hand, by Margarete Verstaar, the competition commissioner, but also Thierry Breton. Um, 
there, there is a, a debate going on uh, if Europe should take a better look uh, in uh, protecting uh, its its own industry. Mm -hmm. uh, there you, there you have, of course, the discussion about the European giants. Should we create an allowed European giants, which might, uh, let, let's say, cause uh, unfair, uh, uh, unfair uh, competition inside the European Union? Remember the Siemens Alstom merger when it when it was about high speed trains a few years ago. Siemens wanted to merge with Alstom. That was not allowed under competition rules. So. Competition Commissioner Margareta Verstaar then rightly said, "No, this this cannot be. Uh, it's not excluded that that's next year or the year after the Chinese come and say we we can sell you those high speed trains for for half the price." Mm -hmm. uh, in other words, this discussion is is go is going on, uh, as is uh, uh, the discussion on where to allow or where not to allow the Chinese to invest. Uh, the Americans have an organization called CFIOS, uh, where investments from abroad, not exclusively from China, uh, are, are vetted uh, before uh, they, they, get, they can be done. Uh, and I think in the European Union, we should be, we should be critical in, in where we allow China to invest and where we, where we say, uh, dear Chinese friends, uh, rather not. Uh, don't get me wrong, uh, you cannot put 1.4 billion Chinese behind a fence. Yeah. Uh, so I'm, yeah. I'm, not, I'm not in favor of, of a containment policy of China, although I see huge risks also in the area, if you mention Taiwan and, 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 and China's uh, and, and ambitions, more general in the South and East China seas, I see risks in China's very uh, expansionist uh, policies in that in, in, in that regard, but China is a superpower. Major question, and then I come back again uh, to the more fundamental uh, issues in front of <coughs> in front of us. Excuse me, vis-à-vis <coughs> -vis China, and that is the question: How do we deal with Chinese civilization, an ancient civilization, a respected civilization? a superpower civilization. On the other hand, a civilization which, uh, of, of which a high party official once told me, and Xi Jinping from time to time tells us all publicly, our model for the protection of human rights is superior to yours. Well, they have one, 1. 1.5 million Uyghurs and Kazakhs yeah. and other Muslims in detention camps in Xinjiang. Uh, think about Tibet, think about Falun Gong, a totally and completely different human rights concept. Now, how do we deal with that? And you see already uh, the, the problems on the, on the horizon. China hits back. China says to H&M, to, to, uh, if, you, if you refuse our cotton, and, and Xinjiang province is, is a major cotton producer in the world, excuse, excuse, excuse us, uh, uh, but then uh, you leave China, please. Uh, in, in other words, that is, in my opinion, a major question. How do we deal with this civilization, with the way it is, it is executed, uh, 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 with the Communist Party, which is totally and completely dominating all aspects of human life, where you have a surveillance state using the most modern uh, forms of, of technical development, Mm -hmm. from face recognition to drones and, and what have you. If you're out of Uyghur and you go to the wrong address uh, and, 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 the, and the, your face is recognized the next, the next day, you're in a, in a vocational training center, as they call, in a camp, as we, as we use it. Qualified as genocide, do not forget, not only by the Dutch parliament, but also by Tony Blinken, the US, uh, the US uh, uh, Secretary of State. That is the most fundamental question uh, we have. The public sector has a fundamental question to answer. The private sector has a fundamental question to answer because they have, of course, an interest not, not, not to be too much limited in what is a huge and important market for them. Uh, I, th I think public and private sector should, should, should very seriously discuss how we go about this dilemma. Mm -hmm. It comes again back to my, to my uh, 
fundamental point, we have to grow used to a world where we have two superpowers. Yeah, and, and this, not one. Would this be the moment then for, for Euro uh, to step up and, and gain more knowledge on, on uh, technological experiences or, or digital uh, on a digital way? Because China is become more and more dominant, as you said. Absolutely. And, and we, we have we have hugely under invested in, in remaining in step with what's happening in, in, in China. Uh, extra complication when you talk about computer chips, it's even more Taiwan than China. Uh, and that makes Taiwan such a, such an extremely hot issue, uh, mm. not only politically, but also in, in chip making, because TSMC, the, the, the Taiwanese chip making company, uh, is, is the biggest coming back to Europe. Why, why haven't we, uh, as, as, as Europeans, with all the brains we have, why do we have to conclude that on 5G we are lagging far behind? Mm -hmm. And we, we have Nokia and Ericsson, uh, uh, and, and, and we want to keep Huawei uh, out, outside of our doors, but, but basically we can't because we have no alternative. I mean, it's, it's That's, in, those are the wake-up calls for the European Union as a consequence of this two superpower world. But is, is Europe not too fragmented for uh, for doing so? Yeah, do you, do Europe is fragmented, it? but but do not forget, Europe is not a state. The European Union has always, since its inception, uh, de developed from crisis to crisis, to, to use a slight exaggeration, and that, that is still the case. Uh, and Europe Europe makes great strides from time to time. The fact that the European Commission can now borrow money on the financial markets is a huge step. The recovery fund is, an, is a huge step in, in, in the development of the European Union. Uh, so I'm, 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 not, I'm not between the pessimists, uh, uh, but I think that, that no. this is a real European moment. Uh, and I have also grown up in an Atlanticist tradition. Uh, uh, given, given my age, uh, and as, as we discussed, given Pax Americana. Uh, and I still think, uh, uh, by the way, that the United States of America were and are still the indispensable nation. That's a value-based discussion, a value question, and the NATO ultimate guarantee question, of course. But, but uh, uh, as, as in, 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 in many other domains, the European Union must, re must realize that we are a financial economic giant. We are a financial economic superpower, really. A superpower which which can match with the United States of America, match with China, and the Americans and Chinese realize this very well. The problem is, we are given the fact that we are not a state; we are a political adolescent at best, yeah. politieke puber in Dutch, <laughs> and and a military midget. We are a military cabalter. Yeah. So would you and then that, say that, that it's that time for a? Has to grow. Would you say it's time for a European army then? Here we, here we come again, like strategic autonomy, a European army is, is a misnomer because uh, I'm in favor, I, I told you, of, 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 of an independent European possibility for projecting half military power. I gave the Sahel example. But a European army presupposes uh, that you have a sort of foreign legion uh, where, for instance, the European Parliament would decide to send our young uh, European men and women into battle. That is, of course, absolutely impossible. Uh, every national parliament, and I've been a parliamentarian in the Netherlands for, for, for a good 16 years or 18 years, I think, no parliament will ever allow to send its young men and women into battle without realizing that this is the core element of national sovereignty mm -hmm. and will will never transfer that authority to anyone else so a european army let's let's forget the expression but let us cooperate and collaborate as much as possible a lot is happening already if you look at the dutch how we co cooperate in the in the german dutch army corps how we cooperate with the with the, uh, the Belgians in the air, uh, hand hand in glove, with the British now difficult outside the European Union, but still in NATO uh, in the sphere of 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 a, of a Marine Corps, with the Belgians in the in the in the Navy, uh, increase that bilateral cooperation, follow my, Macron's idea, President French President Macron's idea. Uh, what he has dubbed, qualified as the European Intervention Initiative, 
see that you you come to your conclusions before it might be needed to send your forces abroad, but keep the decision making, uh, please, please, uh, 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 without any exception, uh, in in national parliament. No, I mean you mentioned uh, a lot of you know, co cooperation between different militaries. Of course, there's countries like the Netherlands where you know, with a limited budget, you might say, is it really necessary to you know invest more in tanks or whatever? Is Netherlands maybe not better place to specialize, say, in cyber warfare? Do, do you think that there should maybe be more specialization between different European militaries? Yeah, definitely. The, the, the Dutch are uh, uh, have found the niche and, and are specializing, quote unquote, uh, as, as far as uh, cyber uh, cyber hybrid is, is concerned. Uh, that 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 is already happening. Uh, un unfortunately, uh, the interests of the European defense industry, and on the other hand, we do not want to become too dependent on, on others, is of course uh, a, a, major a major factor in, in blocking further specialization. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm of the opinion that in, in the long run, uh, we have to, yeah. uh, because budget will not allow, will simply not allow us uh, uh, to have uh, the armed forces as, 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 as we have them now. But then comes the question, who is going to do what? Yeah. Uh, and, and, and we are far from, from that moment, uh, I'm, I'm afraid. The Dutch, as you know, they abandoned uh, a very sophisticated tank capability, the Leopard 2 tanks. But now uh, we, we lease tanks, battle tanks from, from Germany in the German uh, Dutch Army Corps, as, as, as I mentioned. So, much is happening, uh, but by far not by far not enough, uh, and and that that is that is a major stumbling block uh, for for Europe being able to uh, to launch uh, uh, huge military operations uh, where hard protection of, of hard military power is in play. And is it is it uh, then uh, take for example uh, Fold the party he, they they are really pushing forward that. Uh, more and more uh, uh, countries are specializing and then cooperating. Yeah. But is it I was, unrealistic? I was, I was must say, very happy with the entrance of Holt in, in the Dutch parliament. Very happy with the U European party, a real Euro Europe oriented oriented party. They also make a plea for the European army, but let, let's let's forget that. So I, <laughs> I was I was very happy to see them entering the Dutch parliament. I hope that they they will do well elsewhere as well because they are a real European uh, European party. Mm -hmm. Let them let them fan that debate, let them stimulate uh, uh, that debate. We have a lots of lots of interest also in in, in in the Netherlands, of course, because we have a we have a, a, a navy, we have an army, uh, we, we have an air force, we have a military police. Uh, it, it, it will not be easy to say, uh, oh, okay, let, let's, let's abandon uh, uh, the Navy. I could not imagine because I think the 21st century, the Navy will play an important role. Let's abandon the Air Force, mm -hmm. not because I'm a former Air Force officer, but we, we, we just bought, uh, uh, not, not enough, but we bought the AF-35, uh, the Joint Strike Fighter. Mm -hmm. You see, in other words, it, it, it is a very, very complicated issue. Uh, to say we are going to specialize, yeah, in 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 what, and that that should be preceded by a huge political discussion. Uh, but I I think I think uh, the moment has come that that we should really enter that phase. And if if the the limited presence of votes in Parliament could help there, I would be very happy, of course. So you would, uh, in, if you were uh, our age, you would vote uh, for vote or or not? <laughs> I'm I'm I ha I have. Uh, I can't say I've been a Christian Democrat all my life because mm -hmm. I started in days as a sister of E66. But I'm 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 a, a member of the of the city. I'm a Christian Democrat, and and, mm -hmm. uh, and I'll I'll will stay a Christian Democrat till uh, till my uh, my uh, the end of my life. But yeah. uh, yeah. I, I mean, if you would rephrase the question, uh, what would be your second choice? It would certainly be Volt. <laughs> definitely. Okay, great. So, uh, yeah, after after everything we discussed today, um, do you look optimistically at the future of Europe and NATO? Yes, I, I I'm I'm a, I'm a certainly a NATO optimist because I, I I still think that that NATO is the most successful and unique military political military alliance which has ever existed. Uh, I, I was concerned under Trump, of course. Uh, how are we uh, how are we going about NATO? Trump refusing to reconfirm Article 5 on, on many occasions with President Biden. Uh, I said what I said, no, no, not a shimmer of a doubt. 
NATO will be there. NATO has to be there. We discussed Russia. We discussed Putin. NATO has to be there in the in the two superpower uh, world as well, absolutely and, and 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 certainly. NATO, by the way, is part of that family of democracies Biden is is, is trying to create. Uh, the Euro European Union. Uh, uh, I'm 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 an optimist. I'm an optimist. Uh, uh, I uh, I I combine. Uh, in, in my person, uh, being being a, a, a true uh, uh, long living Atlanticist, but also a very convinced European, uh, Europe's hour is now. Uh, I, I I repeat, and and that's what uh, what uh, what I'll fight for uh, as, as 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 long as I can. And I hope, may I end by stimulating your generation, your generation, because it's not my generation calling you salts, it's your generation calling you salts already or at, at least soon that your generation will will uh, will uh, uh, align uh, it, itself uh, I, I hope in all modesty with what i said on on the future of the european union what i said on defense uh, but on balance i'm an optimist definitely I, I i see major challenges but i'm an optimist on balance great that's uh, that's nice to hear uh, yeah, uh, we would like to thank you very much, uh, Mr. Jacobs, for uh, joining us today. Thank you. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Thank Great. you. <laughs> thank you very much. And uh, for the audience, uh, please uh, watch our uh, past interviews with Bas Jacobs and Benedict Fick. And in the upcoming weeks, we will we'll also have an interesting discussion with Femke Halsema and also with Paul Polman, the CEO of the former CEO of Unilever. So I would like you to thank you very much and uh, see you next time.